Today I will uh, continue with the uh, various geometries uh, for uh, electrostatic systems. So I remind you that uh, yesterday we saw, we studied the case of one or two plates and we saw that the concentration of ions goes like C of Z. Uh, there is a certain factor divided by Z plus lambda G square. And there was a prefactor which is 1 over 2 pi LB. So and lambda G is the GUI Chapman. length and the Gui Chapman length is given by E E over two pi L B sigma if sigma is the charge density of the wall. Uh, Somebody asked me what is the interpretation of this lambda G, so I was a bit uh, not very clear. So lambda G is the distance at which the electrostatic energy of a particle is equal to KBT. So if I have a charge density sigma, and if I assume that it's just a simple charge density, then the electric field is sigma over 2 epsilon. Uh, right, it's sigma over epsilon if you can go only on one side, but if you can go on both sides, sigma over 2 epsilon. So the force, if I put a charge E at a certain distance here, the force is F equals sigma E over 2 epsilon. Okay, and the potential energy of the charge, so it's the work that you use, that you take to go from here to here. So it's just sigma E over 2 epsilon times lambda. And let me call this lambda G. Now, if I write that this energy is equal to KBT, you see that it gives lambda G equals 2 KBT epsilon over sigma E, which is 2 epsilon over beta sigma E. And, okay, so sigma is, uh, it's always an uh, absolute value of sigma, of course. And this is just, so if I express it in terms of LB, it's exactly E over 2 pi LB sigma. Right, I remind you that uh, LB is defined by uh, 4 pi LB equals beta E square over epsilon. So L, the, the scale which enters in the decay of the ion, of the counter ion concentration, the scale which enters is the scale at which the electrostatic energy of a particle is equal to essentially to KBT. And beyond that, it decays. And of course, the, the ionic profile as a function of Z goes like one, over, like one over Z square at large distance. Okay, so today I want to study uh, something a bit, so we saw uh, the, the case the case of one plate with salt can be solved exactly, but if you have two plates with uh, salt, or you cannot solve it exactly. So now I go to another uh, important geometry, which is the cylindrical geometry. And uh, the cylindrical geometry, so you have a cylinder which is, uh, let's say, negatively charged in either counter ion or salt. So this, uh, of course, in real life, it's rare that you have cylinders like this, but in biology, for instance, if you take DNA, 
DNA is very negatively charged. And by the way, uh, DNA are the largest charges existing uh, on Earth. Because a molecule of DNA can be billions of bases long. Each base carries one electron charge. So altogether, it's a huge uh, global charge for a microscopic object. And uh, so it's the most charged molecules that exist. So because of these charges, the so a polymer, of course, is, a, is an object which is a completely... Uh, completely random Brownian makes a random coil, but DNA, because of the charges along this, the charges repel each other and it gives a certain rigidity to the chain. So the chain has a tendency to be straight, cylindrical, and there is a notion of a persistence length, which is the, the length over which you can consider that the, that the polymer is a straight line or is not uh, crumpled, not... Uh, okay. So anyway, this, the geometry that we will study is this one. So before that, I want to... Yes? Yes. Sorry? I... No, no, because there are counter ions. It's neutral. I mean, if you are in a solution, as I said, if in real life, everything is neutral. So there are other ions which are, uh, which are uh, neutralizing the charge of the DNA. Otherwise, you would be, uh, your hair would be... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we couldn't uh, approach you. <laughs> Sorry? What is DNA? DNA? There is all kinds of salts in your cell. That's the purpose of this course. <laughs> In biology, everything is neutral, so you have very strongly charged objects like DNA, like membranes, and things like that. And you have ions which are floating around, which are neutralizing the charge of all this. And altogether, everything is uh, neutral. As I said yesterday, you cannot have a macroscopic charge anywhere because uh, it's, not st it's completely unstable. So if you have a tendency for a system to have a certain charge, it will suck charges from everywhere to make the system neutral. Okay? Okay. So I want to discuss rapidly a qualitative discussion of ion condensation in various geometries. So the first, uh, the first geometry is a charged sphere. So assume that you have a charged sphere with a certain charge, uh, let's say Z minus, or with a charge Q minus. So this charge is fixed, and then I put a charge plus E floating around. So the electrostatic potential is phi of R equals 1 over 4 pi Lb uh, Q minus divided by R. And the probability to find this charge E at point R is given by E to the minus, sorry, E to the minus beta E Q minus over 4 pi epsilon R. And this, of course, is to be divided by the partition function. And the partition function is just the normalization, so that Z is the integral d3r with a r, let's say, larger than a, if a 
is the radius of this sphere of e to the minus beta q minus e over 4 pi epsilon r. So this is because of uh, spherical symmetry. This is a 4 pi integral from a to plus infinity dr of r square e to the minus uh, some constant alpha over r. Right? So you see that this object is divergent. This object is divergent because uh, when r goes to infinity, this exponential goes to 1, and therefore this quantity essentially diverges like the volume of the cell which goes to infinity. So if this diverges, it means that p of r essentially goes to 0, which means that the probability to find your ion at any point goes to 0 which means essentially that the ion is unbound. So your ion, which is here, if you have a charged sphere, the ion will go around, will float, but it, you will, it will, you, there is no, the concentration of ion, if you take the volume to infinity, will go to zero, and essentially the, uh, you have an ion floating around and not bound to the sphere. The other example, is a charged plane which we studied yesterday. So I want to see to show you what happened in the case of a charged plane. Yeah, and the reason, the physical reason, of course, why the particle is not bound is that the Essentially, the attraction of the particle goes like 1 over r, so when r goes to infinity, it goes to 0, whereas the entropy of the particle, so the particle is, is in the whole volume, so the entropy goes essentially like the log of r cube, like the log of the volume. So the entropy, the larger the volume is, the entropy diverges, and the entropy will always be much larger than the electrostatic energy, and therefore the particle is not localized and it just goes away. Now in the case of a charged plane, if I take a charged plane with, uh, so what are my notations? With the density sigma. So the, the electric field is E equals sigma over epsilon. Phi of Z is equal to minus sigma Z over epsilon. And uh, therefore, uh, if I do the same kind of calculation, if I, find, if I look what is the probability to find my particle at point Z in the system, it's just e to the minus beta e phi, so it's e to the plus beta sigma e z over epsilon divided by z. So sigma is negative, so sigma is negative, let me write it rather like minus like this, okay? And the partition function z is just the integral zero z, so from zero to plus infinity, dz of e to the minus beta sigma e z over epsilon. So this, of course, is completely finite, it's just epsilon over beta, sigma e, and therefore the probability to find the particle at, a finite, at any finite distance z from the plane, this probability is finite, it's non-zero, and therefore the particle will be localized. It cannot escape to infinity, it has a certain probability always to be at a certain distance z from the, from the center. So this is a normalized. So uh, here, PR equals zero particle delocalized. Whereas here, the uh, charge is localized. Near the plane. 
and you hear it's a it's a charge look. And here, uh, the reason, thank you. The reason, the reasoning uh, can be made the same. Here, you see that when Z increases, the electrostatic energy increases linearly, whereas the entropy will scale still like log Z because uh, times the, the volume. And so you see that now Z is always much larger than log Z. So the attraction of the particle to the charged plane will always be much larger than the entropy, and therefore the particle will be bound to the plane. Of course, it's the entropy which has a tendency to delocalize or uh, to delocalize the particle. It's a, it's a balance. The particles are attracted, and they want to fly away because of the entropy of the free volume. And so whichever wins tells you whether the particle is localized or not. Okay, so this is simple enough. And now we come to the intermediate case, which is uh, interesting, the most interesting case, which is the cylindrical case. So the charged cylinder, so you take the axis Z, let's say, and, uh, and radial coordinate, this is R. So I take uh, charge sigma, uh, charge sigma, so you know that, uh, so it's very simple to calculate the, the electric field, right? To calculate the electric field at distance r, you, you use the Gauss theorem. So you, you, you do that the flux, right? If you have a cylinder, whether, whatever, so you, you take a cylinder of uh, like this and you calculate, so you have the flux so the vector E is perpendicular to the surface because it's a radial field. And, uh, and the flux of E is equal to, uh, to the total charge Q inside divided by epsilon. So the flux of E is E times the surface, the surface if this is R is equal to 2 pi R. The, it's the external surface, so it's 2 pi R times, let's say, L. And this is equal to the charge inside, so the charge inside is equal to sigma sigma being the charge density, times the surface. The surface is pi uh, a square times L, which means that the electric field at point R uh, divided by epsilon. So is equal to a square over 2 epsilon r. No, it's, uh, it's pi a, pi a. Is it correct? Pi, 2 pi, no, it's 2 pi a, 2 pi a times l, right? 2 pi a is the, I mean, if you open this, it's, you have a rectangle like this, so this is 2 pi a. And this is L. So the total charge is 2 pi A times L times sigma, etc. And uh, no 2. Okay, anyway. So the point is that in that case, the uh, electrostatic potential, P of R, K 
can be written as e to the minus, um, let me write it here, p of r is equal to e to the minus 2 e lb. So if I call rho is the linear charge, density, so it's 2 pi a times sigma. Sigma is the surface charge density, so if I multiply by 2 pi a, this is the linear charge density, right? So it's two min, e to the minus 2 pi, 2 e lb rho log r over a. This is the electro divided by z. Right, you see that essentially uh, what you see is that uh, the electrostatic potential is obtained by integrating this with respect to r, right? This is minus d phi dr. So this gives you that phi is equal to uh, <coughs> minus a over epsilon log r, and you need a reference of potential, and you want, so for instance, if you take that the potential on the, on the cylinder is zero, so you put it like this. Okay, and when you go to, so then you multiply by beta, etc. this is what you get. Okay, so, uh, and uh, divided by the partition function. So now the partition function, the partition function is z, equals integral d2r of, uh, of e, to, e to the minus 2 e lb rho log r over a. So it's 2, so times, uh, because, it, because of translational invariance, I don't put the z coordinate. So it's 2 pi integral from a to infinity dr of r times e to the minus 2 e lb rho log r over a. So it's essentially 2 pi integral from a to infinity dr of r to the power 1 and this is just uh, 1 over r to the, so 1 minus 2 E L B rho. Yes? Sorry? Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, Q, but sigma is here. Yes? Oh, okay, so it's a sigma, exactly. Yes. Yes. And that's, and that's how you get the LB and the, all these things. Okay. Okay, so this is the, the quantity. And now you see that this integral the, will diverge or not diverge depending on this exponent which is here. And this exponent, so if so, which you can write as 1 over r to the 2 e l b rho minus 1. So, if 2 e l b rho minus 1, if this exponent is smaller or equal to 1, which means if rho is smaller or equal to 1 over l b, E, then uh, the integral diverges and the ions are delocalized, are not localized. 
right? Because the integral diverges and therefore the probability P is equal to zero. On the other hand, if this is larger than one, which means if rho is larger than one over E L B, I think th there is a mistake. Uh, it should be E over L B, so I, I must have a, it's L B times rho. Yes, it's, I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's probably L B times rho over E. Okay, you, yeah, so you have to, to check, but it's, it's uh, certainly like this because, because of dimensions, right? Rho is a charge per unit length. So rho over E is one over a length and that has to be dimensionless. So I'm sorry that E is like this. Uh, I'll be over E. Okay. So if rho is larger than E over B, LB, it converges and the ions are localized uh, near the cylinder. So this phenomenon, it's a phase transition. We will see that this approach is extremely naive. It doesn't correspond really to the reality. I will show you in detail the solution of the real Poisson-Boltzmann equation. But essentially, it means that there is a, a critical rho star, which is essentially one unit charge per Bierum length. One charge per Bierum length. So if you have a linear charge on a cylinder, which is equal to this rho star, if you are below the threshold, below this rho star, all the ions are delocalized, they float around. And if you are above, above this threshold, the ions will condense on the surface. It condense in the sense that they are localized, they don't fly away to infinity. I mean, the fraction of uh, ions which go away to infinity is zero. So we will see uh, in more details how it goes. And this phenomenon is called Manning, Manning uh, condensation. Did I write it somewhere? No? So this is Manning, or sometimes Manning Ozawa condensation. So we will study this phenomenon in detail. It's a, it's a bit reminiscent if you have studied uh, statistical physics, it's a bit reminiscent to the kosterlitz taulis transition in, uh, in Coulombic systems or in the XY model or, I mean, in 2D, there is a specific kind of transition, which is the XY kosterlitz taulis transition, which is a bit like this. Yes? Yes. We are always in 3D. Yes, exactly. The three types of symmetry, we can marginalize the, the probability density. Yes, so actually I didn't say it here, but you see here the potential, so the electrostatic potential is logarithmic. It goes like log R, and the entropy is also logarithmic. So they can balance. So depending on the coefficients in front of these uh, two terms, Either the energy will win, in which case the particles will, the ions will be localized, or the entropy will win, in which case the particles will be delocalized. But for example, in the, in the first case, the, the charge sphere, charge, if we consider the uh, radial probability, the what? The radial probability. Yes. This is finite, not zero. No, because you have to normalize. You see, the, the point is that. Uh, the, the, it's the normalization. The normalization is it dominated by the infinite volume. And, uh, and the, I mean, it's this balance between the entropy and the, okay. I mean, the, yes? Sorry? I yes? Uh, so, is it second order type of uh, the transition? Uh, yes, sure. It's a, 
Yes, of course, and it's, uh, in fact, you can see that uh, if you, of course, uh, what I will, this is a very naive presentation because it can, it, it, there is only one ion, but in reality, in the real system, you have many ions, this is what we are going to see now, you have many ions which repel each other, so the picture is a bit different, and uh, I will show you what happens, but what people believe is that you have a whole critical phase uh, in the in the condensed case, they have a whole critical phase and. and uh, sorry. Yes, it looks a little bit like the KT transition. But uh, you know, Coulomb gas is equivalent uh, to XY model, and uh, so. Okay, so what I want to do now is to show you uh, the solution. So this is uh, just a kind of hand-waving uh, phenomenological kind of uh, approach. Yes? Sorry, this, uh, this, uh, can be <coughs> characteristic it's a characteristic length at, uh, uh, when you have two charges interacting. It's the length at which the interaction energy between the two particles is equal to kT. So Lb, It's called the Beerum length. So if you have two charges, uh, E, this is LB. So it's the energy is, so it's beta E square over four pi epsilon LB equals one. That's the definition, so which means LB It's another way to write, so LB is beta E square over four pi epsilon. So it's a, it's a way to write the electrostatic energy. If you, in other words, beta E phi of R. If phi of R is one over, you know, phi of R is one over four pi epsilon R, beta E, so beta E phi of R is LB over R. It's a way to write the electrostatic potential as a ratio of two lengths. Sorry, uh, in, in KT It's just the fact that you have algebraic uh, interactions and that uh, in the KT transition, it's the same. You have a balance between the entropy of uh, pairing and the attraction of the two pairs. So the attraction of, uh, of vortices, or if, uh, if you think in terms of a Coulomb gas, the attraction between the opposite charges is logarithmic. The entropy is logarithmic and the costalic starless transition is just a balance between the two like here, so that in this sense. And, uh, okay, it's a continuous transition. 2D is always, uh, is always uh, very spe special because the entropy is logarithmic and the interactions are logarithmic. So you have all kinds of weird transitions in 2D. That's, okay. Okay, so, now I go to the more serious stuff, which is the exact solution of the exact solution of the Poisson-Boltzmann equation for the case of a cylinder. So it's a little bit uh, more complicated. So what I will do is I will consider one cylinder in infinite volume, but uh, the exact solution has been devised in the 50, uh, and it's in fact the exact solution was done for a charged cylinder like this in a big uh, container, cylindrical cylinder of size R, so the small cylinder has radius A, you have infinite uh, cylinder like this, and the ions are confined here. 
So I will not look at the, so the general case is more complicated, the solutions are more complex. Uh, here I will look at just one cylinder, I will assume that we are in infinite space. So I call A the radius of the small cylinder, of the charged cylinder, sigma is the charge density, and uh, again I can define a linear charge density, so the linear charge density is the charge per unit length of the cylinder, so it's 2 pi A times sigma, right? The, uh, it's the rho, if it's the linear charge density, it's uh, the number of charges on unit L, so the number of charges on the cylinder for size L is 2 pi A times L, that's the surface of the cylinder times sigma divided by L. So it's really this, right? Okay. So this is a near charge density. So the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, which is Laplacian phi equals minus C0E over epsilon sinh. Uh, sorry, I take the, so I look at the case with only counter ions. Only counter ions minus, okay? So in that case, you have only one species of ion, which is E to the minus beta E phi. <coughs> so this is the equation. And the boundary condition now is that the surface charge, so phi, so d phi dr at r equals a, is equal to minus sigma over epsilon. Okay. And at infinity, I assume that the charge density goes, I mean, at most, the total number of charges that I will have will neutralize the, the charges which are here. So I will assume that, so C of R, of course, the, from this, right, we have the C of R, the density of counter ions is C0 e to mi minus beta e phi. So I want that at infinity C of R goes to zero when r goes to infinity, or equivalently, phi of r goes to plus infinity when r goes to infinity. Okay, so there is a change of variable. to do. Okay, first of all, because we are in uh, cylindrical coordinates, we can write uh, phi in cylindrical coordinates, so you have z, r, so it's r theta z, r is the radial distance, z is the coordinate like this, and theta is, is the angle, the radial, the, the polar angle in a, a reference plane, projected on a plane. Now, because of the symmetry, this is, of the cylindrical symmetry, this is just a function phi of r. Independent of theta, doesn't depend on the angle, doesn't depend, because you have an infinite cylinder, it doesn't depend on z, where you are sitting on z. So then, the Laplacian in uh, polar coordinates, if you have, if your function is independent of r, is independent of theta and z, it is just d2 by dr square plus 1 over r d by dr. And so the uh, Poisson-Boltzmann equation, which is here, 
takes the form d2 by dr square plus 1 over r d by dr phi of r equals minus c0e over epsilon e to the minus beta e phi. Question? No. Okay, so we do a change of variable. The change of variable is u. You define a new variable, u equals log of r over a, or equivalently r equals a e to the u. And you define a new function v of u equals minus beta e phi of r plus 2u. Or in other words, uh, beta e phi equals 2u minus v of u. So instead of solving for phi of r, I will write this equation as, a function, as an equation, as a partial, dif as a differential equation for v of u, as a function of the variable u. Now, uh, there is a question with the boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions are that, uh, so d phi dr is equal to, let's say, d phi du. Uh, okay, I, I will define psi equals beta e phi to, for, right? So phi, psi is beta e phi, so just to, to simplify the notation. So uh, d psi dr, so uh, which uh, way do I write it? Yes, so d psi dr is equal to d psi du, du, dr. So d psi, psi of r equals v of, minus v of u plus 2u. So d psi du, and so d and du dr equals 1 over r from this, and 1 over r is e to the minus u over a. Okay, so this is just e to the minus u over a times d psi du, and d psi du is 2 minus v prime of u. So I will need d psi dr. I will need the second derivative also. So d2 psi dr square will be the derivative of, so it will be 1 over a d by du of e to the minus u 2 minus v prime of u times du dr and du dr you read it off times e to the minus u over a so it's e to the minus u divided by a square times minus so the first term is minus e to the minus u, 2 minus v prime, minus e to the minus u, v second. So it's minus e to the minus 2u over a square times 2 minus v prime plus v second. Now I need also, uh, so one over r d by dr, so I can multiply both sides by beta e. Okay, so I write that d2 psi <coughs> by dr square plus one over r d psi dr is equal to minus e to the minus 2u over a square 2 minus v prime plus 
V second plus 1 over R. So 1 over R is e to the minus u over A. That's the 1 over R. Psi prime of R. So psi prime of R, I have another e to the minus u over A times 2 minus V prime. So you can see, you can group these two terms. You see that the 2 minus V prime disappear, and you get just the very nice result that this is just minus e to the minus 2u over a square v second. OK. So now I can write the Poisson-Boltzmann equation with these new variables. So the Poisson-Boltzmann equation becomes, uh, so psi, I remind you, psi is beta e phi. So if I want to write it for, uh, for psi, if I want to write this equation for psi, I should uh, multiply by beta e, or I divide uh, all this by beta e. So by beta e, right, to, to get the equation. So this is multiplied by 1 over beta e. So then I have the equation is uh, minus e to the minus 2u over beta e a square v second. That's this term, okay, equals this minus C0e over epsilon and e to the minus beta e phi. So this is beta e phi, so e to the minus beta e phi is equal to e to the minus 2u, e to the v of u. So it's e to the minus beta, so e to the minus 2u times e to the v of u. So finally, you get the equation v second, and this is where you, so you have to do the algebra yourself. I mean, I, I show you. So you get c0 beta e square over epsilon a square e to the u, e to the v of u, which is, so beta e square over epsilon is 4 pi lb, so it's 4 pi lb c0 a square e to the v of u. That's the simplified form of the Poisson-Boltzmann. You see that now it's a standard equation. So when it has, let me check that. Yes. Okay. So at this level, what you do is you look for a first integral. So to get a first integral, what you do is you multiply by V prime on both sides. So you have v prime, v second equals 4 pi lb c0 a square e to the v of u times v prime of u. So this is the derivative of, so you have 1 half v prime square prime equals 4 pi lb c0 a square e to the v prime. And so if you integrate this equation, you have 1 half v prime square equals 4 pi lb c0 a square e to the v plus a certain constant which I call 
how did I call it? Okay, I call it C. Why not? Uh, C is not a good notation because it looks like a concentration. So let me call it D. Okay, so I erased uh, in the middle, I erased the boundary condition. So the boundary condition, if you remember, because you have the cylinder with the charge density sigma, so close to here, the electric field is sigma over epsilon, so you have phi prime, uh, d phi dr at r equals a should be equal to minus sigma over epsilon. Yeah. Is it complicated or? I mean, it's just a standard algebra. It's kind of thing you have to know how to do. So uh, d phi by dr, you can uh, do it here. So d phi by dr is, okay. So d phi by dr is equal, so psi, is phi multiplied by beta e. So it's one over beta e times e to the minus u over a two minus v prime of u. And now u taken at r equals a, if you take u for r equals a, it is equal to zero. So taking the boundary condition d phi by dr at r equals a is equivalent to taking this at u equals zero, right? Because for a equals, for r equals a, u is equal to zero. Okay, so what you have is that the boundary condition becomes, so this is one, so one over beta e a times two minus v prime of zero is equal to minus sigma over epsilon, which is, since uh, sigma is uh, negative, it's uh, sigma over epsilon. Okay, and uh, so I keep this. Okay, so you have uh, two, two minus V prime of zero equals uh, beta E A sigma over epsilon. And if you remember uh, rho over two pi equals sigma A. So this is beta e rho over two pi epsilon. And this is just, if I use the theorem length, it's two times rho over LB. Okay. So if I write, so I have this equation. So I just show you rapidly. I don't want to, to bother you too much, but essentially from this equation, so we have, the bound, we have this equation which relates V prime square of U to exponential V of U. And the boundary condition, which is that V prime of zero equals V prime of zero equals two times one minus rho over LB E. So if I, uh, if I solve this equation, I get V prime 
equals square root of 8 pi lb c0 uh, sorry yes okay uh, no I don't want to write it like this the if I write it to zero I have one half v prime zero square equals so for u equals zero v of zero uh, no I don't know sorry Uh, so what can I do? Uh, v prime one. Yes. Uh, ah yes. Ah okay. So one thing that I forgot to say, of course, is that phi of a is the origin of the potential. So on the surface of the cylinder, I choose phi of a to be zero, which means that phi of a equals zero, which means that for u equals zero, I have v of zero equals zero. Yes, that's what was missing. So then uh, I can write that v prime square of zero is equal to four pi lb c0 a square plus d and if I replace you get that d so this is the where I want to get that d is so if I define a parameter uh, d so I get equals v prime square uh, sorry it's plus 2d so 2d equals v prime square of 0 minus 4 pi lb c0 a square. So I define kappa square. Kappa square equals okay. it's a bit messy but uh, So, but I want to get to some result which uh, will be a little bit more understandable. So kappa square is 4 pi lb c0 a square. So 2d equals v prime 0 square, which is kappa square. 2d is kappa square plus, no. Sorry. So v prime zeros square is kappa square plus 2d. And here I have v prime zero square equals 4 times 1 minus rho over LBE. Okay, so this parameter is just the density. It's the, right? Uh, no, there is a miss. Uh, no, there is a, a sign. There is a, there is a problem with the dimensions. I'm sorry. Yes, I think I made a mistake somewhere. The LB should be in the numerator, but I, I cannot trace it. Uh, it's rho LB over E for dimensional reasons. Um, v prime of zero. So, okay. So when you redo the calculation, please check. There was a mistake here. It's rho LB. So. Okay, so the result now, I, I will write you the, the result and you will see um, what happens. So if I call, I call tau is LB rho over E. So LB rho over E, there was a, 
and the modulus of rho. So the final result, once you use the boundary condition in this, the result is that V prime square is equal to two kappa square, where kappa square is uh, written, where did I write kappa square? So kappa square is four pi LB C zero A square. Ah, yes, it's here. So it's two kappa square E to the V plus four <laughs> times one minus tau square minus kappa square over two. Okay, so from there you can integrate. So when you have this, you write that dv, that v prime is the square root of this, equals dv by du equals square root of this. And then you write dv, so you have du equals dv divided by square root of 2k square e to the v plus 4, etc. And you can integrate the equation and you get everything in terms of one integral. So it's a bit uh, heavy, it's a bit complicated, but so I give you the final result. And you see that, uh, as you will see, there is a transition which occurs for tau equals 1. So I write you as a function of tau. Okay, as a function of tau, we have two regime. For tau larger or equal to one. So tau, I remind you, is rho LB over E. So there is a special point, which is tau star equals one. And tau star equals one means rho star LB over E equals one, which means rho star equals E over LB, which means when you have a charge density, a linear charge density on the cylinder, which is one electronic charge per Bierum length, there is a phase transition. The phase transition is the following. So for tau larger or equal to one, beta E phi of R is equal to two times log r over a plus log of one plus tau minus one log r over a. And for tau smaller equal to one, beta e phi of r is equal to two tau log r over a. So this is the final result. Depending on whether you are above or below the threshold of one, of one unit charge per Bierum length, if you are below you recover, this is the standard Coulomb potential created by a charged cylinder, right? Tau, tau is just the, the standard uh, two pi a sigma, so it's just the standard uh, charge, linear charge density times the log r of a. So this is the expected result of the electrostatic potential created by a cylinder. And when you are above the threshold, you have a correction, so you have no more tau here, tau in, in comes in there, and it's a, you have a term, an additional term, which is a log of a log, which occurs here, okay? Uh, if you look at the concentration of the ions, I see that I forgot part of my notes, or maybe not. Okay. 
So if you look at the ionic concentration, in that case, okay, so the uh, C of R is E So, in fact, in that case, you can see that this corresponds to C0 equals 0, which means that there is no, no charge on the... You see, this is exactly the free potential created by a cylinder. And that means that the charges, all the ions, are unbound. They, don't, they are not bound. They don't modify the potential created by the cylinder which means that if you take a box bigger and bigger, all the ions will fly away like a, like a normal uh, gas. Okay, and uh, what I want to say is you can calculate the fraction of uh, bound ions. So if you calculate the fraction of ions which are bound, so what happens is that here the ions unbound, And here, part of the ions are bound. So how do we get the fraction of ions which are bound? It's by just calculating NB, number of bound ions, equals integral from A to infinity, D to R, of N of R, or C of R. And that's just 2 pi sum from A to infinity, dr of R, C of R. Okay. So you can calculate this in both cases. I let you do the calculation. In the case where tau is smaller than 1, so in the unbound case, you find that nb is equal to 0. And in the case where tau, so if, when you are above the threshold, you have a fraction of the ions which are bound, and this fraction is given by is equal to tau minus 1 over Lb. This is the number of ions which are bound per unit length of the cylinder. So you see that at, at tau equals 1, it is 0, and it goes continuously up to uh, whatever all the ions getting bound. Now, there is an interesting thing which I want to, to show you, which is uh, quite important, and that's the whole essence. So what ha the picture, when, the, when you are in a, above the condensation, you have your cylinder, and you have a certain <coughs> profile of ions, and so a certain fraction of the ions will be bound to the cylinder, and because this NB is not the total charge, it's only a fraction of the ions which are bound, and all the other ones are free to, uh, to go in free space. So what I will show you is that, so this is negatively charged. Here you have plus charges floating around. So what I will show you is that if you look at the, so if you look from far away, you see the cylinder, which is with uh, some positive charges sticking on it, when you are above tau equal one. And what I will show you is that the total number of charges which are stuck on the cylinder or which are bound to the cylinder make su is such that when you look far away, the apparent charge of the cylinder is exactly the critical charge. So if you put your cylinder, let's say you put your cylinder in a, in a counter-ion solution, 
and you increase the charge of the cylinder. So when the charge of the cylinder is weak, everything is unbound. When you start hitting the critical tau equals one, so one by increasing the charge, some ions will start to bind to the cylinder. They will bind in such a way that the apparent charge of the cylinder remains critical equal to one, always. So you will add more and more charges to the, to the cylinder and eventually the total charge will just be one. The way, so this is related to this uh, quantity. So this you can get by integrating this, uh, by, by calculating C of R, the concentration of ion, and integrating it like this. It's not a trivial calculation, but it's doable. And you get this simple result where tau, I remind you, is the density, the linear density of charge times Lb over E. Now, the total charge on the cylinder, so the total charge on the cylinder is the essentially tau E over Lb, right? The total charge on the cylinder is, is essentially its rho its rho, let's say, times L, if I L. So per unit length, the total charge on the cylinder is just rho. Now the number of bound charges on the cylinder per unit length is tau minus one over Lb. And so it's rho Lb minus one, rho Lb over Elb minus one over Lb. So it's rho over E minus Lb. And so if I look at the apparent N charge, N uh, effective charge of the cylinder when you are above, above the transition, uh, so there is a factor of, sorry, there is always factors of E which are, so it's, uh, actually it's the number of bound charges. So if it's in terms of charges, it's like this. Okay, so it's N total. So the, to the number, the apparent charge is the total number of charges that you have on your cylinder minus the charges which are bound, right? It's the difference between what is stuck here and if you look here, what you see is the difference between the total minus what is bound. That's the effective charge of your cylinder in the solution. And so it's N total minus N bound. And this is just, okay, so actually the number of total charge, let, let me write it rather like this. It's rho over E. Right? The, why I'm always confused with this factor of E, it depends if we t talk in number of charges or in charge itself. The, the ratio, the factor E comes from that, right? The total charge is, is, rho is the charge density, so rho over E is the number density. That's why I have always this uh, stupid mistake. So, if I call, if I t t talk in terms of charge density, so the total number of charges is rho over E, that's the total charge per unit length on the cylinder. <laughs> The total number of charges bound to the cylinder per unit length is tau minus one over Lb. This is what comes out from this calculation, which I don't do because you see it's a bit complicated calculation. So this is just rho over E minus one over Lb. So now if I want to see what is the effective charge of the cylinder once all the ions are bound on it, 
you see that it's this minus this, so it's just 1 over LB. And 1 over LB is just like you have one charge per LB, per barium length, so the system for any value of tau, for any density above any concentration, any charge density above the threshold, the charge density, the apparent charge density of the cylinder remains constant, equals to the critical density 1 over LB. And that's a very interesting result. It's a kind of charge regulation. You cannot have, uh, you, if you charge and charge your polymer your, or your cylinder in a, in an environment of uh, counter-ions, you cannot charge it. It will just uh, suck the counter-ions on the surface so as to keep always a maximum, a maximum charge density equal to 1 over LB, equal to the, to the threshold uh, density. Yes? And this is true even when you have counter-ions and uh, no. ions of both? No. no. It's only true for counter-ions. Yes, but okay, so counter ions, uh, of course, it doesn't really exist uh, situations, but if you're in very, very low salt concentration, so there is very few co-ions, and then, uh, but this is observed experimentally. I mean, in DNA, it's very, very frequently, you can see this occurring, this uh, Manning condensation, and this uh, kind of charge regulation occurring in DNA when you vary the charge, by changing the pH or things like that, you can control the charge on the polymers by changing the pH of the solution or things like that. And then you can see this charging, uh, this saturation of the charge and constants of the charge experimentally. Okay, so this is uh, for, for the counter ion case, so as you can see the calculations are a bit laborious uh, and uh, so now in the case of salt I will just uh, spend a few minutes on the case of salt, so the case of salt can be solved exactly but it's extremely complicated, it's a pan levé kind of equations and uh, there has been a solution which was uh, found uh, a few years ago it's a uh, it's, uh, very complicated uh, and it involves a uh, uh, theory of integrable systems actually. So I will not discuss it. So what I will do is uh, I will discuss just to give you a flavor the case of, of salt but in the dubai huckel uh, framework. So if you have, so in principle you should write the Poisson-Boltzmann equation for a charged cylinder in presence of salt this time. And in presence of salt, your uh, Poisson-Boltzmann equation again is the same. It's going to be Laplacian phi equals 2 C zero E over epsilon sinh beta E phi, where C zero is the bulk concentration of the salt far away in the bulk uh, of the system, <coughs> with the boundary condition. So the boundary condition, as usual, is d phi d r equals mine equals sigma over epsilon. Okay, so as usual, we linearize this equation and it becomes Laplacian minus Laplacian phi plus kappa d square phi equal sigma uh, equal zero with phi prime of zero of a equals sigma over epsilon. This boundary condition is that r equals a. So this is the linearized version of this. 
and the kappa d square is 2 c0 beta e square over epsilon and beta e square over epsilon is 4 pi lb so it's 8 pi lb c0 and that's the Debye constant to the square or 1 over the Debye length to the square. So again you go to um, uh, to cylindrical coordinates so the equation becomes minus phi second plus phi prime over r plus kappa d square phi equals zero with the boundary condition and the solution is in terms of Bessel functions so the solution involves some special functions which are Bessel functions and the Bessel functions are defined so the solution I will write you the exact solution the solution is psi of r equals beta e phi equals minus 2 lb rho over kd a so kd kappa d is the Debye uh, constant times k1 this is a Bessel function k1 of kappa d a times kappa d K0 of kappa d r of r uh, kappa d so kappa d is here and it's 1 over lambda d square the by length so k0 and k1 are Bessel functions of 0 and first order so Bessel functions it's a special functions I don't know if you have ever heard about that it's it's uh, functions which are defined by certain properties initially they were defined by some partial differential equation I can give you several definitions of these uh, Bessel functions but you see it's funny to see that uh, such a simple linear equation involves these uh, complicated functions so these functions the k alpha k alpha Bessel is defined by x square d2 by dx square k alpha plus x d by dx k alpha minus x square plus alpha square k alpha equal zero with the boundary condition that k alpha of zero <laughs> equals plus infinity and there are some integral representation which I can give you which is k alpha of x equals integral from zero to infinity dt of e to the minus x cosh t times cosh alpha t so k0 for instance you put alpha equals 0 so it's just this exponential k1 you have cosh t and so you see that for instance k1 of x so see if you have cosh t here it's just minus d by dx of so k1 of x is just minus d by dx of k0 of x so you have this uh, function which is like this what you can show is that at large that's a property of this so these Bessel functions are tabulated you can find them uh, if you use Mathematica you can find them in all uh, all books it's uh, very well studied very so 
if you take this property, this here, this shows that when r goes to infinity, the solution phi of r behaves like e to the minus r over lambda d, or kappa d r, divided by square root of kappa d r. So it decays exponentially at large distance, and there is an additional factor, 1 over square root of r, instead of 1 over r uh, that you usually have in the Bayhuckel. But you have this, uh, the standard uh, exponential decay, uh, which is characteristic of salt, right? When you have salt, you have screening, and you have exponential decay. OK, uh, because I'm supposed to stop, maybe I will stop here. I will uh, finish this in a few next time. And uh, then I will start the field theory part next time. Any question? Yes? Sorry? Notion of what? Uh, yes, OK. First of all, all this is mean field. The theory is mean field because Poisson Boltzmann is mean field. So the scaling is a bit uh, trivial and not uh, very interesting. There is no exact, uh, as, I, as far as I know, I, I don't know.